Okay. So, what we are going to do now, I'm also going to put the timer on this. I don't want to spend too much time on it because I want to make sure that we have time to go forward. All right. So, my timer on. Um, so, what did you all come up with when you were looking at reviewing the material? Don't share everything that you came up with so that we can kind of get as many people involved uh, as possible. Okay? So, are you willing to start the show? Um, so, I came up with that the family is constructed by society, but there is no such thing as the family as referring to the Western family, and that there can be protection without reproduction. Okay. Okay, so we've got that the family is constructed by society, right? This is why I hate to put the chairs there, because I already was going into it, right? I would have stepped on your phone for sure. Um, that okay, what we think of as the family is actually explicitly Western, right? That it is geographically and historically specific. So what we're talking about isn't right, any kind of the universal sense, but is explicitly Western in trajectory, and then the other thing that you said was that there can be no reproduction without production and vice versa. Right? That there can't be any reproduction without production, there can't be any production without. Reproduction. Anybody? Somebody else? Really quick. Why is that the case? Why do you have to have production in order to reproduce? Let's start there. Christine? Do I have it now? Because everybody needs food. Okay. Because everybody needs food. Right? One of the main components, not the only, right? But if you look at reproductive labor, see if anybody got this. Okay, there's two ways of thinking about reproductive labor. If we like dichotomize, even though dichotomies are problematic, if we dichotomize reproductive labor, okay, what are the two primary tasks? Not like the specific things, like we have to feed people, but in a general sense, we want people to do what and what. Anybody remember? I mean, I know I do because I say it multiple times, but yes. Right? Is it we want to survive and we want to thrive. Okay? Now here's the thing. How many of you want to survive? I, I mean so long as it is possible, right? Because even though there's like really rich people, particularly rich white men, right, and that's true, I could be documented, um, uh, who are doing all sorts of research on longevity. Right, like trying to figure out how to evade <laughs> death, right? and they're doing this. They've got they've got billions of dollars to to spend, right? So while some of us are trying to figure out how to pay the rent, others of us have so much money that they're trying to figure out how to evade mortality. Lo and behold, they're not going to be successful, right? They're not going to be able to evade mortality. If you want to live a little bit longer, don't eat as much meat. End of story. We we'll have to do a whole lot more research than that. Okay, so nobody can actually evade mortality. We know that. But in the meantime, right, we want to survive. Right? We don't want to necessarily participate uh, in, in the process. We want to respond to that. But how many of you also know in your day-to-day -day lives that you want to do more than survive? Anybody? Right? Like, thriving is really important. Right? When we're stuck in survival, when we're stuck in survival mode, does anybody know the impact that that has on the body when you're stuck in survival mode? Okay. You're shaking your head. You know? Yeah. Lindsay? Mm -hmm. Lindsay, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you're stuck in survival mode, it releases a lot of cortisol, which is a fancy way of saying you're really stressed out, right? Or maybe not a fancy way, but a physiological way of saying that you're really stressed out which increases inflammation, and in case anybody's wondering, inflammation is the cause 
not only of things like arthritis, but it's the cause of heart disease, it's the cause of dementia, and just about every other illness that we can think of, right? It's about inflammation. So survival is important, uh, but also from a physiological perspective, it's, that's not the only thing, right? So we want to thrive, okay? We want to thrive. So to do this, of course, means that we have to eat, right? Eating is also essential to thriving, I would argue, right? Like there's eating to survive, and then there's eating in a way that brings you joy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Like, we can do both. Okay? We can do both. So why is it that you have to have um, reproduction in order to produce? So we've just talked about why we have to have production in order to reproduce. Right? Why do we have to have the other way around? Yeah. Well, um, uh, in the economic sense, it's probably to make sure that there's that there's more people to use more resources to get people to Right, right, absolutely, right? Because not everybody can participate in production at the same time. Part of the reason that we need different generations, that we need differently aged people, and that we need variety, right? When society is too young, that is a concern. If society is too old, that is a concern, right? We need to have a balance, a generational balance, because those generational uh, uh, the people in those generations participate in socially necessary labor differently. Right? So in order to maintain production, we have to maintain reproduction, because otherwise the people who are produced, right, who produce, will eventually have to stop, right? And if we don't have anybody to replace them, then the economy stops the economy stops, eventually we're all going to die, right? <coughs> Many of us will. Some of us can devolve, <coughs> excuse me, we can go back into hunting and gathering, right? But that would be really hard given the fact that in this context we've killed all that land. <laughs> and so not everybody would be able to survive, we have to relocate, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. I'm curious, yeah. friend, what would this mean for a country like if I heard most of the population now is millennial age or younger, so what, what would that mean for, because right now it seems that there aren't a lot of uh, people? <coughs> yeah, so whereas like in Italy they have the reverse problem, in mm -hmm. Italy the population is aging and there's fewer young people. Mm -hmm. Now, so in a lot of ways I can't answer the question because I don't know enough about Egypt or Italy, I don't know enough about the specific dynamics to be able to answer the question. Knowing that there's people out there who can't answer that question, I'd rather defer to them, right? So all we can say, though, is that it's going to create variations of social problems, right? Um, uh, in terms of skill, in terms of, uh, right, in terms of who's going to have the qualifications to fill the necessary in the labor market, for example, mm -hmm. right? When the society is too old, then it becomes uh, much more, um, um, uh, what's the word that I'm, that I'm looking for? Um, that, that, that it becomes much more crap. I told you that, my, that I was working a little slow, that my brain wasn't going to be uh, as good as it possibly is. Um, if the society is too old, of course, then there's the concern that the society or the culture or the institutions could cease to exist, right? Like, you think about it in the context of a language. If it is only the older generation of people who know a language and, they're not, and the younger generation isn't learning the language, then eventually that language can die out. And so there's that concern, right? So, but, so those are just some general things. Specifically in Egypt and Italy, I can't, uh, I just, I don't know enough to be able to answer the question. Yes. So in the general sense, that's kind of what I can give you, right? Um, is when the society is too old, then we have the possibility of losing stuff that we might not want to lose and or being unable to do things. Right? The reason that we're concerned about the baby boomers, right, is because of, uh, of the workforce. If there are more retired people than there are people working, then that's an economic imbalance that's going to be problematic particularly given the fact um, that the baby boomers have the expectation of receiving retirement benefits, right? 
But those retirement benefits come from the people who are currently working. And if there's fewer people who are currently working than are retired, then we're not putting enough money into the retirement system to be able to pay all of the baby boomers their retirement. Right? And so that's why, so that's just yet another example. And that's going to pop up again with the millennials, right? Because the baby boomers, which was the largest, it, and it was an anomaly, right? I mean, population has been declining um, since the Industrial Revolution. And the only blips in that decline are baby boomers, right? And then when the baby boomers started reproducing, they had the millennial generation. And so, but like Gen Xers, a small generation, and then the generation, I think they're calling them Generation Y so far, um, right? but those are like kind of historically normal states of reproduction, right? So the baby boomers and the millennials are a consequence of these like historical blips, and that's also why they're concerned, right? The, the Gen X, not enough Gen Xers to fund the baby boomer retirement, and so far, the millennials, for reasons that are, um, for the most part, outside of your control, right? millennials haven't been moving into the workforce at the rate uh, that other generations have, right? So millennials aren't yet making up for um, the, the low population of Gen Xers. Okay, so that's just general concern, right? General concern. What else did you come up with, summary-wise? Well, what were some of the other things that we were talking about the last time uh, that we were here? I see you, but I just want to hear from some other voices. Jasmine? Okay. All right. So when we say that family is constructed by society, right, one of the ways family, in particular a certain kind of family structure, right, that family structure is instituted through policy. Right? For example, child labor laws. You have child labor laws, and then the outcome of child labor laws is that you are then going to have to have some form, some way of supervising those children. If they no longer go to work with you, if you can't supervise them at work anymore, then that policy is going to have implications. Right? It's economic policy but it has implications for family structure, right? It facilitates in creating the homemaker, okay? Uh, two more, two more things. There's, I mean, we could just spend a whole class period reviewing what we talked about. So two more things before we go on. Anybody else? You talked about the Dawes Act and how we shift from agricultural to capitalism. Okay, so the Dawes Act is another example of policy. Right? It also fits in, if you can see, uh, if you can imagine, uh, Bonnie Thornton Dill, right? She focused on uh, Chinese migrants and Chicano, uh, not really migrants, right? Like the, uh, the Chicano experience was more a consequence of the war and the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe because they didn't migrate anywhere, it's just that the borders changed. Uh, in, in 1848, right? Um, and to my understanding, I'm not an expert uh, in this, but to my understanding, Chicano is different from like a subset of Latino, right? And it specifically refers to people who live in the Southwest who were Mexican until the treaty was signed and then became part of the United States, right? So it's like a particular border uh, experience uh, in that regard. And then she focused on African Americans. Yeah. Dill could just as well have talked about Native Americans in the United States, right, and how policies in the United States shape uh, the Native American experience as well, because you'll find similar dynamics, right, Native Americans, uh, by way of policy, not having access to the, uh, the, the traditional, right, or the ideal nuclear family, right, we'll talk about the race, class, and gender dynamics more in just a second, but the Dawes Act, of course, is another policy, right? Another policy that helps to shape and construct uh, the economic system. So the Dawes Act was a sign of the movement out of agriculture and in, into industrial, right? It was about moving Native Americans off of tribal land and into private nuclear family, single family homes. Context. 
which is also about power. Right? Removing people from their culture is a way of removing them from access to resources and power that they might have. Okay, one more. One more thing that we talked about. Yes. When you Right, the shift to capitalism, and, and what else? Anything else? The, the, that's fine. Okay, so we talked about the shift to capitalism and the impact that the shift to capitalism has on family structure, right? That is to say, when we all of a sudden, if we have a new system of economics, uh, right, then because of the interconnectedness between the economy and the family, and as we shift to capitalism, then inevitably dynamics uh, in family life are going to shift along with that. Okay, so, uh, thank you. I know there's plenty more to share, um, but it was also nice to hear some uh, different voices as well. So, uh, on that note, though, since, on the le- oh, since we ended with the shift to capitalism, right, let's start, done, um, by talking about the requirements of capitalism. Okay, so, so ultimately, I'm going to do this in such a way that we're reviewing the relationship between the breadwinner and the homemaker in nuclear family. It's like model of family life with one woman, one man, 2.5 kids in a private single family home, right? Where one of the people goes off to work in the labor force and one of the other uh, stays home to do reproductive labor as well as productive labor, right? In the pre-World War II industrial era, don't forget that the homemaker is also doing productive labor. Okay, really quick, does anybody remember what kind of productive labor the homemaker is doing? No, no, but in the home. The kind of productive labor that the homemaker is doing in the home. Yeah. Correct, right? So in the pre-World War II, early stages of the industrial era, a lot of the goods that are produced in the industrial economy, they're mass-produced now, but they're not necessarily yet finished products, right? So there's still a lot of finishing labor that needs to be done, like turning fabrics into wearable clothing and turning foodstuffs into consumable foods. Yeah, right. Like so now you can buy mass produced flour but you can't eat flour. Right? Like it's, you still have to do something to it in order to turn it into an edible product. Okay. So we're gonna talk about the requirements of capitalism in such a way where we can review the relationship between the breadwinner homemaker and nuclear family and capitalism. Uh and, and then also set the stage for a more nuanced conversation, not just about gender in the form of the breadwinner and the homemaker and men and women's roles, but then also adding on some uh, dynamics of race and class like Dilda in the article. Okay, Stephanie can bring all it up to the surface so Dilda goes in um, with more detail. Okay, so, uh, you know, I think it's probably best to just really quickly review three primary features of capitalism. Okay. Organized around competition. And these are not necessarily in order of importance. Right? They are in order of competition just happened to come out of my brain first. Capitalism is organized around private property. the Dawes Act is part of the creation of private property, right? Kicking indigenous people off of communal land and into private property. Right? And then capitalism is organized around profit growth. Okay. So, private property and profit are important, particularly in relation to each other, 
because as you all know, since profit is organized privately, that means individual people have control over the profit, and they can choose to do with that profit whatever they see fit. Right? Most of the people who have control over profit keep most of it for themselves and their families, right? Even though sometimes they do philanthropic work by sharing it with others, usually the philanthropic work is a drop in the bucket compared to what they have access to for their own families. There's some exceptions to that, right? Bill Gates, for example, um, are exceptions to that. But nonetheless, for the most part, individual people who have control over profit keep it for themselves. That's, of course, right, where we get the issue of wealth inequality in capital. Right? It's not just because we have private property, and it's not just because we have profit. It's because we have both. Because profit is property. And it is subsequently controlled privately. Okay? Now, also, what's important is that profit has to grow. Right? In capitalism, or, or it's organized around profit growth. Right? And competition has a negative impact on profit. Mm -hmm. Competition has a negative impact on profit. Now, in particular, competition has a negative impact on profit growth. Because in the face of healthy competition, in the face of a lot of competition, that drives down the cost of goods. Which is good for us, right? But it's not good for profit. Okay? So, subsequently, one of the inevitable consequences of these three dynamics is that capitalism will always, and this is a historical thing, in the sense that it will be a slow push, because competition changes, right? So if you go through periods where there's a lot of competition, then you're going to see downward pressure on wages. And if there's limited competition, then you're going to see raises increase. You're going to see wages, not raises, so potentially also raises. Right? When competition is high, wages are low. Right? When competition is low, wages are high. The baby boom, right after World War II, is a consequence of low competition and high wages. Right? People didn't have lots of sex because they missed each other during the war. Because, right, like, like, like a mythology of romance. Right? I mean, the reality is that people had lots of sex all throughout the war. Some of which was, uh, uh, was problematic. Right? One of the things that we know is that rape and sexual assault actually increased during a period of war. Right? So it wasn't about a lack of sex during the war. It was that after the war, wages were high because competition is low. And when wages are high, people feel comfortable having lots of kids because they feel like they can afford having lots of kids. Right? Keep in your mind this was in 1945, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? This is before birth control. Right? This is before the pill. So much stuff we could have talked about that was a historical anomaly, right? Because actually the historical trend is for wages to slowly decline. So the outcome of these three things right, is the, the downward pressure on wages. Right? In capitalism there will inevitably and always be a downward pressure on wages.
So there's two things here then, right? Capitalism is organized around mass production. Okay. Which means using fewer people in the workforce because now we have more machines to do the labor. And so we already talked about that one of the things that emerges in that space, is right, that's where the creation of the breadwinner homemaker dynamic comes from. That we have to do two things. We have to shrink the labor pool to make way for machines. But we also have to create the conditions for profit. Okay? And there's two ways to create the conditions for profit given the downward pressure on wages. One of those wages is to make sure that the wage earner is exploitable. And that's what we talked about in terms of gender, right? Creating a breadwinner makes a more exploitable employee. Now, one reason for that is because the breadwinner has dependents, and so he's less like, like he's not going to take as many risks at work because he's got people depending on him, right? His ability to be a good human being is now predicated on his role as the breadwinner. Okay? The other thing that makes him more exploitable is the fact that the homemaker is ensuring that he is sufficiently rested and focused on work and nothing else. Right? The homemaker feeds him. He owns, the homemaker takes care of the kids. The homemaker takes care of the house. Right? In essence, if you think of the like 50th stereotypical archetype, right? <laughs> the breadwinner comes home from work. And his main job when he comes home from work is leisure. It is to rest. It is to recuperate, right? When he comes home and if he's working class, he's going to open some sort of domestic can of beer, right? And if he's more white collar, then he might have some scotch or some whiskey, and then he's going to get fed, right? And then after that, his primary task is tied to digest and then go to sleep and then to wake up and go to work the next day, right? The homemaker makes sure that he is prepared and rested for work, which makes him more productive, which makes him more profitable, which makes him more exploitable. Right? So the homemaker is a central component of the kind of exploitative dynamics of being a breadwinner. On top of that, the homemaker is doing productive labor for no wages. Okay, so here's the other condition, right? Since capitalism has to grow profits in the face of these conditions, right, it's always going to put a downward pressure on wages. So one way to deal with that is to make sure the wage earners are more easily exploited. Right? And now that we don't have breadwinners anymore, we've just replaced that with student loan debt, by the way, as an example. Right? Like, right? I'm serious. We are more exploitable. <laughs> When we enter the workforce, we might not enter the workforce anymore with partners and kids, but we do enter the workforce with thirty to one hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, which makes us less likely to take risks to work. It's just right. It's a historical shift. Okay. But the other way that capitalism deals with this downward pressure on wages is to seek out the conditions for free labor whenever possible. Right? Okay, yes, but now let's focus. That's absolutely correct. Right? Um, the increasing push forward unpaid, it, it, like in a thing of prerequisite increasing, that you have to have an unpaid internship in some field, that is absolutely the case. It, it's a good 21st century example. Right? Of course, what Dill is talking about, if we go back to the early industrial era, historically speaking, what Dill is talking about 
is the, the obvious, right? The one that tends to get the most historical attention for obvious reasons in the United States, of course, is the transatlantic slave trade, right? And the use of forced slave labor. Right? It's a way of growing profit without necessarily having to increase wages, right? Slavery is great for capitalism, right? But I should say, slavery is great for profit, right? Slavery is, slavery is great for profit. And of course, slavery was predominant during the historical era, right, keeping in mind where as we transition out of agriculture and into mass production, we have an industrial economy. We don't actually truly industrialize everything. Right? We don't truly industrialize everything. Certainly not in the 1800s. So now we might have developed machines. We literally have. We have finally developed machines. Uh, that are capable of picking a tomato without bruising it, right? And this is just recently. But prior to that, you couldn't do that, right? You couldn't have a machine pick the tomatoes because the tomatoes are too sensitive to the machine, and it would be it would bruise the tomatoes. Uh, and so, and so, right? So you had to have human labor to pick the tomatoes, as an example, right? Not everything can actually be replaced with machine labor. Right? So in those kinds of economies, particularly in agriculture, right, where it's not possible to replace, in agriculture in particular, you see uh, the conditions of even further exploitation that gets added on with uh, uh, oppression, right, where exploitation and oppression are not the same thing. So breadwinners, white middle class breadwinners are exploited, right, but the Chinese laborers and the African laborers uh, and the Chicago laborers that Bill was talking about, they're exploited and oppressed. Right? Because they're exploited in conditions of violence. Right? Violence that is physical, violence that is emotional. Etc. Etc. Right, but it's still necessary. Leave. Still necessary. And so, what you see from uh, when you open it up. So, if you're just talking about exploitation, you tend to find the gender dynamics of the breadwinner and the homemaker. You open that up to include exploitation and oppression, and to look not just for how to keep wages low but the conditions in which we can limit wages entirely, right? Because, you know, even still, you all know that farm labor is exempt from minimum wage laws, right? So people who work in farm labor are exempt from being paid minimum wage, right? So you can think that the kind of agricultural labor conditions of the, uh, of, uh, the South during slavery you can think that that's in the past, except it kind of isn't, right? It kind of isn't. And the conditions that uh, that exist today, the only reason that they're even a little bit better than they were before, has anybody heard of Cesar Chavez? Okay, so like in the United Farm Workers and that whole uh, labor movement in the 60s and 70s, I can't remember when the big strike was, uh, but my thing, the exact years is not important to us right now. Um, but because of that movement, because of the United Farm Workers and the work of Cesar Chavez, they did get some protection for farm labor built into economic policy. Right? But being protected by minimum wage laws was not one of those. So those dynamics are still with us uh, into the present. And it helps, again, right, to keep wages down. So you look at both exploitation and oppression, and of course one of the things that you find is that racism helps to produce the nuclear family. Right? The policies. Keeping in mind here that when I say racism, I'm not talking about people's prejudices. I'm not talking about what people think in their heads. That's kind of the psychological, it's, it's important, right? But it's the psychological component. Right? 
One of the things that Dill makes clear, and that other scholars make clear, is that racism, when it comes to what people think, right, like the prejudices that people have towards people of color uh, in the United States, that is an outcome of creating policy. It's not a precipitating factor. Right? It is an outcome. Slavery started not because people were prejudiced towards Africans. Right? Of course, slavery started before we ever had boats. Which means the transatlantic slave trade is an important aspect of the history of slavery. But the history of slavery doesn't start with the movement of Africans into the West. Right? Slavery starts, I mean, you just go back to like ancient Greece and Rome. Right? Slavery exists there, for example. Right. So slavery is an economic system. Slavery is an economic system. Colonization, which really started in the 1400s and really heightened in the 1600s. So by the time the Industrial Revolution rolls around, the transatlantic slave trade is a consequence of colonization. Right? And then ideas of race emerge support the economic practices of colonization. Okay? So in this sense, in essence, what Bill is talking about is that you've got in capitalism, right, you've got this ideal gender division of labor. Because in capitalism, It works really well. Okay, so in capitalism, you've got the ideal gender division of labor. And it's made possible by economic policy. But then economic policy is racialized. So for example, only white men were able to earn wages. And so because of that, right, only white men were able to accomplish this ideal gender division of labor. Right? The breadwinner is an economic position. It's a gender position if we expect men to be the breadwinner. But strip away the body who's performing it, right? The breadwinner is an economic position. It is an economic position whereby the person who is the breadwinner has the economic capacity to support dependents, which means that the homemaker is also an economic position. Right? So this ideal breadwinner-homemaker dynamic isn't just a gender division of labor, it is also a class division of labor. In particular, Right? It's the dynamic of middle class families. Right? So it might be the ideal, but historically poor families have not ever been able to afford it. Right? So that you can say things like women have always stayed home to take care of the house, but that's not the truth. Because poor women have always worked. Right? 
And of course, one of the things that Bill outlined, and that, I mean, we all know just from being alive in the present, is that there's an intersection between race and class. Right? So that even though poverty is inherently, it is not inherently racialized, right? By number, there are more poor white people than any other group of people in the United States. Right? There are also just more white people than any, right? Like that's just a statistical inevitability. Because, right, 60 to 70 percent of the population is white, and so by number, most of the poor people are going to be white. Right? But if you look at over-representation, you all know what this is? It's the idea of proportionality, right? If African Americans make up 12% of the population, except 30% of African Americans are poor, right? Then there is an over-representation going on there. If Native Americans make up 10% of the population, but for, I'm, and I'm just making up these numbers for purposes of illustration, right? Um, so they're fairly accurate. They're not, uh, they're not like write downable multiple choice question on the test, right? right? But if Native Americans make up 10% of the population, but 40% of Native Americans are poor, and then there's something going on there, right? So that we know that one of the consequences of racism is in the form of resources, right? One of the central functions of institutional racism is to take resources away from people of color to be given to white people, right? If you restrict people of color's freedom of movement, then what you do is you actually increase white people's freedom of movement. If you restrict the neighborhoods that people of color can live in, then what you're doing is you're opening up more access for white people to live wherever they want. Right? I mean, that's how it works. That's how it works. And so the consequence of that is that racism has class Right? If one of the dynamics of institutional racism is to limit the resources that people of color have access to. Then of course, subsequently, one of those resources is access to the cultural ideal. Right? That white middle class families have had access to the cultural validity of having families that look more like this ideal of the breadwinner homemaker, single family home, nuclear family model. But that ideal is accomplished through the labor of women, through the labor of people of color. Right? That is to say, freeing women, right, freeing white middle class women from having to do wage labor and having and getting to be homemakers is done, is made possible in part by all of the labor that women of color are doing. Right? And you see that really well if you're looking at the South during slavery, right? It's a historical inheritance. Is that white women are free to, right, so middle class white women, wealthy white women, right, slave owning white women, are free from labor be precisely because of the work of the African American women in Northern right? And as we move out of slavery and more into the 20th century, right, African American women might move out of domestic labor and into industrial labor, but then you find other migrant women doing that work. Right? So that's where you find Latina women or women, uh, Eastern European women, right? doing the domestic labor. Right? So what frees, right? so the labor that middle class and upper class white people are free from is done through the labor of poor families. The domestic labor in particular of women of color. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, I'm 
and I think we've already covered this point uh, sufficiently. That what's going on here is that what all what all of these dynamics are doing is race, class, and gender dynamics, which all emerge out of policy, right? Like constitutional policy that dictates who has right of access to private property. Right? You have to be considered a citizen in order to be able to have access to private property, in order to be able to have access to wages. That's an example of the economic policy. But so clearly what's going on here is we're organizing in this shift out of agriculture into industrial. We're organizing both reproduction, reproductive labor, and production. Right? Who's going to do the necessary labor and under what conditions are they going to do that labor? race, class, and gender right, are primary mechanisms of figuring out who's going to do what labor and in what conditions they're going to do that labor. Right. Remembering that one of the requirements in capitalism right, is income inequality. That if you organize profit privately, it inevitably it's going to create dynamics of income inequality. That has to be organized. Who's going to have access to profit? Who's going to have access to wages? And who's going to be pushed out of wage labor entirely? That has to be organized. It's not automatic. And so race, class, and gender become economic dynamics that help to organize those processes in capitalism, right? Facilitating then the ability for capitalism to increase profit. Okay, so one of the things that we're going to, um, my, my final point, and then we're going to look at the schedule before we part ways today. There's this concept of cultural and structural lag. I mean, you know what a lag is, right? Like if somebody's up here and you're lagging behind, right? So you know what a lag is. If we're talking about cultural lag, we're talking about our beliefs are changing slowly in particular, right? Cultural lag is when the structure is changing faster than our belief systems are changing, right? Structural lag is when the culture is moving faster than our structure. Okay? We've seen it happen in both ways. Right? In 1954, when the Supreme Court passed Brown versus the Board of Education, right, we were dealing with a cultural lag. That is the structure change to mandate desegregation. The culture was not prepared. The culture had not shifted as quickly as the structures did, which is why, of course, there are all the examples of all of the kids that had to go to school with members of the National Guard. Right? Now, right, a modern example that culturally, right, our ideas about drug policy, right, like our ideas about marijuana in particular, right, our beliefs in relationship to those policies are changing faster than the actual policy. Right? I could be wrong about that, but that's my general assessment. Right? Because the culture is moving faster than the structure. Right? Either that or I just happen to know a lot of people who support legalizing marijuana. <laughs> And I just happen to have never met like the millions and millions of people who want to still be. But you get the point. So one of the things that we're going to be grappling with, and it's not a new phenomenon, right? One of the things that Jill points out is that women of color have been engaging in the second shift. Right? Some of you are familiar with it being called the second shift. Jill calls it the double dip. Right, but either way, it's when you are expected to both breadwin and homemake. That is, when you are supposed to both do productive labor and reproductive labor. Historically, women are the ones who are put in this position. Historically, women are the ones who have to do both productive labor 
by way of going to work, but then coming home from work and having to work a whole other shift because of all of the reproductive labor that has to be done at home. Okay? Now, this idea made it into the mainstream only, really, in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't until white middle class women started working a second shift that this became a cultural conversation. Right? Even though women of color, as Jill points out, have been working a double day for hundreds of years. Okay. Which of course also means, there's plenty of other examples, that white middle class women have a lot to learn from women of color when speaking about strategy, how to deal with them. But either way, what we're dealing with now in the 21st century is we've got the legacy of this race, class, and in particular gender division of labor right, that we're still, right, both our culture and aspects of our structure are lagging behind. Right, behind the fact that we are no longer in a predominantly industrial economy. Right? This, this, this breadwinner home maker division of labor which is sustained, the gender division of labor that is sustained by race and class dynamics. Right? But it is central to an industrial economy. And we no longer have an industrial economy. So one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest issues of 21st century family life is the continuation of this particular family structure as being ideal in the face of economic conditions that no longer make it possible or feasible. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to look at the schedule. This article. Okay, did you guys? Did you look at Stephanie too? Right. That article was really straightforward. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, anybody? Did you look at the bill? Also, pretty straightforward. A little bit more academic than two, but still pretty straightforward. This, this introduction, you're going to read the introduction to her book, uh, Eva Alou. It's great. It's brilliant, uh, in, in my opinion. It's also much more complicated than the past couple of articles that we've been reading because she's much more like theoretically heady, using big words kind of thing. Okay? So, just be prepared. When you look at it, look at it. And then have one of those moments where get out of it whatever you can before class and trust that I'm going to walk us through it. But in essence, we have to, part of what she's going to be introducing, Kuntz, we're going to go back a little bit to Kuntz as well because she introduces this um, in her piece. But we're going to start looking at this, uh, how to deal with this history. Right? We have inherited this history, but we're now in a different context as well. So how do we deal with the legacy of what we've inherited? What she's going to be adding into the mix is the emergence of romance. The emergence of the idea of love. Which is, of course, central for us going forward. But I want to look at the, just remind you of the schedule here. Your article summary is due uh, by Wednesday. Um, keeping in mind that if anybody, uh, that I'm going to have the link open until midnight, it's not due by the start of class, it's just due by the end of day, so that anybody who wants to do the one on love, uh, can write your summary after having the lecture. Okay? Um, and then I'm going to post, uh, I've been slow to do so, which I apologize, uh, but by tomorrow morning, I will have posted my grading rubric for the article summary so that you can see what I'm going to look for in the grading. Uh, and then keeping in mind that a week from today, the college is closed, which I totally forgot because I scheduled my dog to go to dog daycare. Like you talk, you paid thirty-five dollars, and I didn't even remember that I'm going to be. Uh, then I want to be here, uh, and then when we come back after that, we're going to start doing uh, our first concepts and connections. Yeah, so the articles I'm writing the any of the articles yeah. you've read so far. Yeah, one article. So you okay. pick one of these articles and you write your summary on it. Keeping in mind this article, that the summary um, that sh it should be short enough, right? You're not rewriting the article. So it needs to be short enough, uh, but also not too short, because you want to make sure that you indicate that you've read the article. So I think an ideal summary is like a good, healthy, long paragraph or two paragraphs, and that should be about it. Right? Do not plagiarize. 
Right? That will be one of the things that I grade for, though. Okay? Again, I'll post my grading rubric by tomorrow morning, though, so you can see it. Okay? Thank you for being here. Stay warm. I'll see you all on Wednesday.